Um, it's so nice to meet you, first of all. Thank you. This you is too. the book. Plug the book. What's the book called? I've forgotten. Exit Stage Left. <laughs> yes. The Curious Afterlife of Pop Stars. Nick, thank you so much for coming on. I've read thank it. Thank you It's about me. halfway through it. And this, regular viewers of this show, and this will go out as a separate podcast as well for everybody to enjoy, but regular viewers of this show will know my favourite bit in, in the pop journey is... And where am I based? There remember? are two bits that you like the best. Just before... Just... No, that's my career. I don't like that bit in pop stars. For me, it's just, just as it starts it. to turn sour. Right. Just as it's starting. And quite right. often, I'm a big Monkees fan, Nick, and quite often uh -huh. it's when the band <clears throat> gets control. When the band takes control, Bay City Rollers, Monkees, right. it starts to turn. Tell it, why did you, why did you write this book, Nick? Um, it was something I wanted to cover for a long time now. I wanted to look at how musicians manage their life after their first flush of fame you know how, how do they endure and reinvent themselves and continue to to thrive i've been writing about music for for many years now and when i first started at 2021 i was interviewing singers and bands who were also 20 and 21 and they were going to take over the world and they didn't write songs because it was their job they wrote songs because they absolutely had to it had to come come out and it was really exciting and i kind of believed every word they said because they believed every word i said but then as i got older they got older and they were releasing their fifth album and their tenth album and in the interim life had happened to them mm. and so they had learned how to deal not really with failure but just the reality of life that not every band goes on to become u2 or madonna or the beatles or taylor swift and i found that they became more interesting as they went along, perhaps in the way that all of us become more interesting because our backstories are now behind us and it kind of forms the people we are. And I knew there would be stories there if people were willing to talk about I'm it. I'm surprised. How did you <clears throat> how did you word it in the email? Because I'm surprised that so many people from so many different, you know, big stars, kind of smaller stars. I'm surprised you got that many people. <clears throat> how did you word it to them? I suppose the honest answer is I was entirely honest right. with them. And I came from a point, and you've read the book, so I, ho I hope you'll agree with me. I, I came from a point of pure admiration for them. Yes. I've been doing this for 30 years now, and I don't think I would have interviewed bands for such a long time if I didn't really admire them. You know, these are people who dared to dream and then had that dream come true. So I kind of find them amazing. And I, yeah, full of admiration for them. So, And I knew that at the beginning of a, an act's career, there's a disproportionate amount of attention placed on them so when the music press was still around you know we would be sent to interview bands all over the world and document everything that they said and I, th I got the sense that they liked being listened to by the time of their fifth album and their seventh album and beyond they had just as much to say but people weren't listening because mm. the zeitgeist had kind of gone that way so I just asked them completely honestly what's it like to not live for that 15 minutes of notional fame but to make this your entire career, that what you do with your life is write songs in the hope that I sing them when my heart's broken or when I'm cooking mm. for the family or when I'm walking the dog. What's it like that songwriting is your job? And what's it like if your audience sometimes diminishes, as most people told me? At some point, your audience will slightly or greatly diminish simply yeah. because we are fickle. We move on to the next thing and then we move on to the next thing after that. And I... The people who did say yes, and I suppose the inference is there is that lots of people said no, but those who said yes seemed to really enjoy talking about it, and they were right. philosophical and existential, and they made me laugh, and sometimes they brought tears to my eyes, but they had such metal and determination about them. You know, they'd been tested, but they were never going to stop because they'd found that one thing in life that they really wanted to do and they were good at doing. And that was the thing. When we heard about it, we're both a bit, oh, is this going to be a little bit snarky? But it's not, is it? No, not at all. And Good. what I also found beautiful about mm. it is, like you say, as people get older, they've got more stories to tell. Yeah. They also have less to lose by being honest. Right? Completely. When they're younger, they're overwhelmed by it and they're being <clears throat> really sort of pushed in a certain direction yeah. by people who appear to know better. Yes. But here they're speak of themselves. Yeah, they're being marketed in the early days. And what a lot of them told me was that they, that perhaps they liked the concept of fame, but they were then being marketed and they were being told what to wear and what to say. And they were being sent on this plane and that, air, you know, that train and this TV mm. station and that radio station, say this, say this, talk in sound bites. And I, I realized as a journalist initially that there's a reason, I guess, why so many of them wear sunglasses because they are hiding. They want to keep something to themselves. And many people in the book say time and again, 
in different ways that they didn't like fame. They found it a poisoned chalice. They felt that they were being compartmentalized and shoved down a road they didn't want to go. They wanted to write different kinds of songs, but because they'd had hits, the record label said, no, 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 write more hits and, yeah. and, and lose a bit of weight and, and stay cute and whatever you do, don't talk about drugs. And so it was just this weight around their shoulders. And the moment they kind of shrugged it off, they all seemed to embrace it and think, thank God for that. It was a giddy carousel. I enjoyed it while I was on. I'm glad I had that. But God, I'm happy to be off because <laughs> now some... I can kind of live my own life. There are some, obviously, there's like the Beatles and the Stones, and they're kind of yeah. completely different. There are some exceptions to the pop world. I remember watching Robbie Williams go on and on and on. And I kept thinking, when is his bubble? And his bubble did yeah. burst eventually. Mm -hmm. But you compare it to someone like, oh, I don't know, David Cassidy or, or you know, those kind mm -hmm. of pop stars who, who had about 18 months. He went on for years and take that are bigger than mm -hmm. they ever were. And if you follow the history of pop, they should be like a pub quiz question now. Shouldn't they? <laughs> yes, they should. I think they've learned from their predecessors' mistakes, as your T-shirt reminds us. You know, the Bay City Rollers are really taken advantage of and hung out to dry. Mm. So the bands, the boy bands and the girl bands and all bands of the 80s and then the 90s and beyond saw that. They watched it with, with interest, I guess, and an awful lot of sadness and thought that's not going to happen to us. And that's why I think Robbie, who I, I speak to in the book, is so fascinating because although he had all the talent to survive forever, as you said, Ian, he... He was somebody who was going to crash and burn. He, he suffered with depression yeah. over the years and he was very fragile. As, as much as he had a huge ego, he was quite fragile as well. So his narrative was someone who was going to be a firework. He's going to look really good when he's up in the sky and then come to earth. But he didn't. He, he managed to sustain it. He When he finally ended his imperial stage, when he was having albums that sold more than the last one, he took time off. He yeah. grew a beard. He discovered UFOs. He decided to do his own thing. He then had a family and he thought, you know, I, I don't mind no longer having hit singles. Mm. Absolutely. Part of him would still like to be number one, but he knows what that costs him. And he's done it for 30 years. So he will never, I think anyway, stop releasing albums and playing live, but he will do it on his own way in his own time. And that's directly because the members of Bay City Rose to name but one didn't and you know look mm. at bros as well bros were another one of those yeah. acts who really didn't you know they really had a kind of hard time and even they are are kind of coming back aren't they in their own way the really big bands that burn very brightly there does seem to be a period of inevitable obscurity but if they can just ride yeah. that obscurity out 15 20 years <laughs> they can be big nostalgia stars remember when that bros documentary came out three or yes. four years ago and they were playing earl's court uh, yeah. Not Els Court, sorry, the O2. They're playing the O2, Els Court, yeah. I'm so old. Um, <laughs> and there is, you know, again, the Beach Boys are slightly different, but they had a period where they couldn't sell 200 tickets to a show. Mm. And they can't. you have to kind of ride out that, that fallow period and then come back as a nostalgia. Yeah, act. David Bowie did the same, didn't he? He had a really tough time in the yeah. 1990s. Nobody seemed to want to embrace Tin Machine as much as perhaps he'd like it. By the time he was in his 60s, he could do no wrong. And a lot of the people I speak to in... The book say that they think that nobody really likes a midlife pop star because nobody mm. really enjoys going through the process of midlife anyway. It's a liminal stage. We struggle with it. So when we look up adoringly at pop stars, we do want to see the, the you know the cheekbones, the 27 year old forever, or we want to see them at the other stage of the year if they haven't died and they reach their 60s and 70s and beyond. Then we reassess their back catalogue. Mm. They become super they, they become legends and icons and that's what happened to bowie and that's what happened to leonard cohen and bob dylan who i think just a couple of years ago had his first u.s billboard number one album yeah so those artists who are currently in their 40s and 50s have never gone away if you look at spotify they are constantly releasing albums they are constantly being streamed but yeah they're waiting patiently for that for fad and fashion to come back round to them and say they're still here and they were fantastic all along let's embrace them again and I, I love that. I love the fact that they are there throughout our lives. I was just thinking about when we went to see Cher. Oh, bloody <laughs> hell, yeah, that was insane. And also, in the same year, we saw Ronnie Spector, who should have been as massive as Cher. Ronnie Spector was, selling, was playing a three-quarters full Shepherd's Bush Empire. Cher was playing a couple of nights at the O2. Both of them yeah. sounded like they did on the records. Yeah. You know, they were absolutely fantastic. There's no reason why she shouldn't have been as big apart from her choice of marriage, I suppose. Um, we, of need course, to talk, yeah. we need to talk about Adam Ant, right, because... Um, 
uh, you 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 interview Adamant in in the book, and I try to maybe ten years ago. My sister's in the the room, and she'll know when it was. I worked at Virgin or Absolute. It may have been then, and we had an email. Anyone want Adamant? No one went for it. I went. I'll flip in have Adamant. You know, he'd been not been around for a while. But I remember my sister was a huge, huge Adamant fan um, growing up. So I got Adamant in. Now, he was eccentric, as I want all my pop stars to be. He wouldn't come in the building unless my, my um, producer went and met him. He brought in Andrew Sachs's granddaughter, who'd slept with Russell Brand, you know, as part of that whole Saxgate thing. And she, during the record, she kept saying, you can ask me about that if you want. I think I don't want to ask you about that. He was delightful. He phoned up my sister and left a message on her aunt's phone. All right, Joe, it's Adam man. <laughs> and we got we got on. But it, it, and obviously he he's slightly different in that he has serious mental health issues. I think he's bipolar. I can't quite remember. Mm-hmm. Um but his comeback was very odd. I, I saw him play two gigs. One was the one I think you write back in the book, but it was at the Electric Ballroom in Camden, okay. where it started at 7.30. So me and my sister got there at 8.30, because who wants to see the support act? He'd already done an hour. What, like a kid's party, 7.30? Yeah, he, he'd already done an hour. Tickets like 50 quid. We got free ones. So he saw that, and it, it was like two and a half hours, and he was doing Rolling Stones songs, and it was people were like wandering about and bored. And also, I had the great pleasure of introducing him at the garage, I had to. He did like a little solo gig with his Rick and back, and I got to go. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Adamant. Um, he, I mean, he's slightly different because I think he, he, he sees things slightly differently. How did you find Adam? When well, you just, just to be him? clear, I didn't interview him for the book. I right. interviewed him ten or eleven years ago when he played those garage shows, right. okay. and I included him in the book because I found his story so powerful, and he was so eloquent in talking to me about what it's mm. like when. You know, he, I think he, he was diagnosed bipolar and he said that he constantly has this creative tornado going on in his head. And at his heyday, when he was able to express that creativity through, you know, being on top of the pops every other week, you know, being essentially the biggest pop star in the world yeah. and certainly getting me interested in pop music for the very first time as a 10 or 11 year old. He had an outlet and he felt good with himself. He could manage that when that went away, he said. It was much harder because he still had all the creative urges. Mm. And when it went out, it didn't seem to reach that too many people. And that was frustrating for him. But I thought he was so inspiring when I talked to him because he he was talking about mental health at a time that I hadn't heard it within the media. It was not on the front pages of all the paper. And he said that I really want to talk about this because I'm not the only one. I think you'll find many people within the creative arts and elsewhere suffer from mental health issues. And if we talk about it more, we will understand it more and we will, they will, will reduce the stigma. And I thought, obviously, in the years since, it's now become this, it's, it's everywhere. So yeah. just as he was a trailblazer in the early 1980s with music, he kind of became a trailblazer in talking about and it was, what happened thing. behind that afterwards. So- Sorry to interrupt. It, it was a brave thing to do then because he was a joke. Really? He was a joke. He went to a nut house. He shot a, a, a window in a pub. He was a joke, you know. He because... was angry because he was constantly being prodded. And, you know, yes. that's the awful thing that once you're a pop yeah. star, you are always a pop star. So mm-hmm. I understood that he was just trying to go about his life quietly. Yeah. Somebody will recognize him in the, you know, post office queue or down Give Little him some or some of that. You're right, Adam. Yeah. And it, that's, that's awful. You know, yeah. you think, so he could never kind of relinquish that or or leave it behind or just lead in inverted commas a normal life so there is a kind of stigma so if you then have an afterlife wherever it may takes you you are constantly being dragged by hello adam hello whoever yeah and that must be quite difficult and he did struggle with it quite reasonably being recognized is great when you got a load of money but when you ain't got no money, it's, it's shit. Very quickly, just the last thing on Adam Ant. He, people mm. forget how big he was. He was the only white artist at the Motown 25th wow. anniversary show, you know. And he's, I think he's, he's smoking crack with, with um, what's going on? Who's what? Marvin Gaye. Marvin Gaye. I think, uh, 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 no, he would have been dead by then. He was doing, anyway, he was doing, but he's the only white artist at the Motown 25th anniversary. That's right. crazy, mm. right? Um, how cool is Bill Drummond from KLF? What Brilliant. a great what a great opening to the book that is. I was very happy because obviously I I'd, I'd approached all sorts of people that I admired, but also I thought people who could tell an interesting story, but a different story from the, the one before that I'd interviewed. So I approached Bill Drummond, who kind of has done things his own way throughout his career. He's been a music producer. He's run his own label. He's been a manager. And then he was a pop star. 
He had a number one single, more than number one, number one single all around the world. Then he wrote a book with Jimmy Courty from the KLF on how to write a number one single. And then at the very height of their career, they did what no band or very few bands ever do. They bowed out on top and disappeared. And he went on to become an art provocateur. So I asked him um, to contribute to the book. Could I speak to you? And he, he declined to speak to me, but he said he would write me a couple of plays. I love and, it. He'd write me a couple of plays. And so I thought, I have no idea how these plays are going to come out. But basically, he was telling me how he felt about pop. And he, th- if I understood the plays correctly, um, it's that he thinks that pop is this perfect thing that should exist within a time capsule. So the very moment either Nick Kershaw goes off the boil or Prince, stop, finish, bye-bye. Don't yeah. con- continually come back on the nostalgia circuit. Don't play the old hits constantly just disappear much like the KLF did but I found that with everybody else I interviewed they didn't really want to leave they enjoyed their job and they wanted to carry on and the audience for them was there if you see me typing it's just because I'm putting the link to the book in the chat and um, if you're listening to the podcast we'll have the link in the the podcast in all the the details and stuff there I wanted to ask you about the Happy Mondays and how on earth Bez and Sean Ryder ended up being Mm. well basically sort Mm. of national treasures Mm. who would have thought it would be those guys what an amazing story that's the great thing about music isn't it it kind of throws up all sorts of pop stars from the brilliantly produced to the seemingly chaotic and I suppose the Happy Mondays seemed like one of the chaotic bunch but my I've interviewed Sean several times over the years and he's an incredibly sharp clever Mm. character you know he had he liked to have fun when he wasn't playing music and probably while he was playing music but he said that once the mondays imploded as most bands do he was never just going to go away he was in this for life so he started another band and that did even better black grape and then when that imploded as well he thought well what do i do now so he started writing for the newspapers he had books many oh many his books column out. when i was doing rise in 2003 a breakfast tv show and yeah. his column in the sport which he didn't write <laughs> no, but jesus not. it was it was the it was the no, funniest but thing he became a character he was a character and he exploited that didn't he absolutely then he's you know he did i'm a celebrity and everyone thought again that that was going to end terribly sean Ryder in the jungle would be terrible but he was this charming avuncular presence he'd seen that bez had done celebrity big brother the year before and both of them however improbably or not came out yeah as you said national treasures and now he seems to be if they're not doing dancing on ice they're doing this morning with phil and holly and he's this incredibly charming maverick that never kind of goes away and you don't want him to go away because they just don't make people like him very often i've had bez shout at me have you? Yeah, he was on a TV show I was doing on BBC Choice. It used to be on BBC Three, Liquid News. And it was, oh, yeah. you'd have two guests and you'd talk about showbiz. And he was talking about the Falklands War. And in my ear, they're going, you've got to move on, Ian. You've yeah. got to move on. I've got to move on, Ian. Okay, Bez. All right. Anyway, now let's go and see what's happening in LA. And afterwards, mm. he had a go at me. Bez or Sean? Bez. Right. He had a go at me saying, you should have let me speak. I was like, I'm really sorry they're in my ear. Mm. And then like a year later, I was at some event uh, done by Clint Boone and Bez was there and he kept me going, you're that fucking wanker that wouldn't let me. T-. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, man. It was, it was not a very pleasant experience. I tell you who I like in here, Tim Booth. Tim Booth from James. That, that was a great story, right? He's, he completely changed his life. I found that um, because music seems to be such a satisfying pursuit for anybody who pursues it, once it's over for them or once they've left or music has left them, they find it really difficult to fill that vacuum. What are they going to do next? Tim Booth was always a bit of an outlier in that regard anyway. He moved to Northern California and now teaches various kinds of alternative practices. So he does these amazing dances that he always did on stage anyway. Yeah. He was always incredible to look at. He now teaches that to people. Wow. Um, he acts occasionally. He's recorded with Angelo Badalamenti and he agreed to come back to James only on the understanding that they wouldn't simply be a heritage act. As much yeah. as he was proud of their back catalogue, he wanted to look to the future. So when James got back, they recorded new albums and they were great. And it's obviously there is an argument to suggest that when people go and see them live, they want to hear sit down and come home and all the hits. And he's, he says something on his Twitter page, that, look, they may play the old songs every now and then, but if you're going to come and see us, we are a future forward looking band so accept that we're going to play what we want when we want because that's why we exist. But yeah, as you said, Ian, he's very happy in Northern California doing his alternative 
health practices. Even, uh, you know, Paul McCartney has talked about he knows when everyone's going to go to the toilet. He can see everyone go to the yeah. toilet when he plays a new song. He can see well, they it. They are getting on a bit, are they? And that, <laughs> but, you know, and, and, and he's, he's, he's suffered with that for years, yeah. you know, and he's talked yeah, it about it quite hard. often. It must be tough going, here's, here's, here's a new one. Oh, shit, everyone's... <laughs> yeah, I've seen, I've seen the Rolling Stones play live twice. I think the first time was 1990, the second time in 2005. And both times there was a little Keith Richards solo spot. And it, these were in stadiums. And it was amazing to see, not hundreds, thousands of people stand up and go either yeah, to the toilets or for hot dogs or to put more money in the meter for their car. And you just thought, is that, is that heartbreaking? Do they accept yeah. it? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy for them, I suppose, from a creative standpoint. There's also, I tell you, what, I'm really old, right? Because there, there, there was an act in this book. I'm thinking, what are they doing in it? They're really current. Oh, and there's like, oh, then they're <laughs> Franz Ferdinand. Right, come on. I thought, but they're quite new. Oh, it was 2004. Oh, okay. Yeah. Time, time flies here. Time, time flies. <laughs> really does. That's like 20, 18 years ago. I guess they're kind of, I'm a big, we're big Sparks fans. And I know they did FFS oh, yeah. with them, but um. He was great. Alex from Franz Ferdinand, as one would imagine from kind of an mm. art school rock band, he was very articulate about the whole phenomenon. I felt that this was a subject that he could lecture on from a podium and I would be in the front row mm. taking notes. He was, he was amazing. He'd clearly given it a lot of thought. By the time Franz Ferdinand hit, I think he was comparatively old for a new pop star yeah. in his early 30s. So he, by rights, he should have been 21. So he had prepared for it. So when they took off stratospherically, I think I sensed the part of him wasn't surprised. He knew how good they were, mm -hmm. how much of a finished article, but he also knew that this was a moment in time and moments in time pass. So he has kept things really interesting for himself ever since as well, doing solo projects, the Sparks project and, you know, Greatest Hits has come out and you know what happens when a Greatest Hits comes out. The, the record company, maybe this is changing slightly in the age of streaming, but once the a hits collection comes out the record company starts to look over their shoulder for the next one yeah and so i got the sense here yeah, from alex capranos he wants to keep things interesting he knows that it will never be 2000 again 2004 again for franz ferdinand there, there will never be that incredible urgency around them that incredible excitement because we've had the excitement and that excitement has passed but he told me that ultimately he wants to die on stage he is never going to stop no matter what happens this is him for life we saw uh, a couple of weeks ago. We went to gig at the Royal Albert Hall, and we saw two of these acts. I guess we went. Oh, yeah. I'm big, we're big fans of the Bare Naked Ladies. Yeah. I love the Bare Naked Ladies, but also the opening act, Katie Tunstall. Katie Tunstall, who okay. I used to. I loved her album when it came yeah. out, and then, and then hadn't really thought of her. And and it was just her with the loop pedal doing that like amazing oh, yeah. mega busker thing and that she does. I, I saw her on the bill. I said, oh, yeah. and we were there. I said, should we go and see her? Yeah, sure. Why not? Mm. It was it was incredible. And mm. that's part of the, 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 I mean, she again was, was comparatively old. I think she was in a th 30 or something when that yep. first, al that big album hit. Um, there is something about experience m makes a really, really good performer. She was incredible. 40 yeah. minutes on her own. Telling stories. Telling stories, playing songs I didn't know, you know, as well mm. as the hits. Mm. And I was there. And she's a tiny person. Yeah. In the Royal Albert Hall, you'd think that she'd be yeah. rattling about. It was just wonderful. Everyone was on her side. And no one, I don't think anyone was feeling like, okay, now it's time for, you know, the main act to come on. She got the whole place absolutely bouncing. It was wonderful. And there is a lot of that, yeah. isn't there? Experience. The experience that, that these people have to, to put on good shows and quite often make some of their best music as well. Yeah, I guess by that stage, they're pros. Like everybody in life, you tend to hone your craft, whatever your craft may be. You do get better. You tend not to get worse, do you? So more than one well, musician... Well, I don't know about that, Nick, I couldn't say. <laughs> more, more than one... Several people I spoke to said that there's this suggestion that you write your best song between your best songs between 23 and 27. Ooh. I guess because it's so new and exciting, yeah. and it just has to come out. Bob Dylan said that he couldn't write the songs he wrote in his 20s at any other stage of his life. But that didn't mean he got worse. He got much better. And as you said, you know, when you go and see these these bands who've been ar around a while, we may have forgotten about them. And they never go away. But more importantly, their songs never go away. Mm. What I loved most about or, or so interested about in this industry is that you can have three minutes of inspiration 
10 years ago, 50 years ago, and that three minutes will work for you forever. Mm. The song will be covered again by other people. It will be used in a mobile phone advert, or you will bring it back out in a 25th anniversary. And the song will just bring you from obscurity or the margins right back into the spotlight because as much as the songs get old in a literal sense they never really do do they yeah. so to, to watch katie's tunsil with her pedals which was so dazzling umpteen years ago on later with jules holland because i personally had never seen it mm. it was amazing again you think i remember this i yeah. love it and it taps into nostalgia as well it taps into a time when we were going to gigs all the time perhaps and all of that works in the favor of the artist so it doesn't do them any favors to walk away. You know, they should stay around because their songs are busy working for them. Um, very quickly, my sister says, I really enjoyed Nick's recent article in The Guardian. So congratulations. Oh, thank you. you. If thank you are you listening, much. if you are listening to the podcast, we will put the link in the the. the thing the book is by nick durden d-u-e-r-d-e-n it's called exit stage left left exit stage left the curious afterlife of pop stars it's a thick old book as well you're getting your money's worth with this it's a thick old book there's so many acts in here but I, honestly i was so surprised to, to read about the guy from the stereo mcs what a lovely guy you know <laughs> chumba wumba what an interesting yeah adventure chumba wumba was i don't want to give away any more stories though it's all in here and you know it does go from the stereo MCs to Joan Armour trading to Adam Ant. It's nuts. The line uh, uh, it follows. Nick is um, is it too early to ask? Are you working on something else? Uh, I'm certainly not working on anything else at the moment. No, you're done. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. I'm done. Good. Yes. Good. Nick, it's so <laughs> lovely to talk to you. I wish you the best of luck with the book. I think it's absolutely fantastic. So thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you. Thank you both of you for having me. I really appreciate it. Really it's a pleasure. It. We'll see you later on. Thank you, Nick. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. There we go. Bye. You see, it really is a cracking read. What a lovely fella. Isn't he a nice guy? Isn't he? What a nice guy. What, imagine he'd come on and he'd been all... Horrible. He hasn't. We've been emailing each other quite a lot. I don't think people were telling these stories no. if it wasn't personal. It's a really, really good book. I'm going to put the link into the chat one more time if you are listening, because we're going to put what we do is we put our interviews out as free bonus podcasts. You've got quite a bit of work to do this one this week. I know. Um, if you're listening to the podcast, do go and have a little look at it. It's uh, Exit Stage Left by Nick Durden, and it's uh, really, really good. My sister says this book sounds right up my strass. So, well, Joe, if you if you wait, if you wait, uh, then maybe. 0203 286 6370 is the telephone number if you want to give us a call. I guess it's time for the great reveal. Do you think it's time for the great reveal? I think we could probably reveal a little, yes. Um, so, first of all, the question is who is singing? <laughs>